Hey, Claudius. You killed my father. Big mistake. Greetings, fellow movie fans. Welcome to Real to Real, your home for an ever-evolving discussion of film in all of its forms. My name is K to the P, and I am Vi Mayer, and here we'll be discussing our vice, films that we love that might not be so loved. And today we're starting with one of KP's favorite, Thy Last Action Hero. So growing up, I've actually never have seen The Last Action Hero or heard even much about it. I grew up loving Arnold Schwarzenegger films. I love Predator, love Terminator. I watched Jingle all the way when I was a kid, but no one has ever talked about Last Action Hero. For as long as I've been on this earth, no one has mentioned it. It wasn't until KP and I became friends that there was like just slight mentions here and there. We would watch something and uh, a Charles Dance would show up and be like, Last Action Hero. Uh, a meta joke would be made. Last Action Hero. And I was like, what is this movie? <laughs> and uh, after much convincing, because I've been never moved for some cheesy action film, uh, we watched it. And uh, thankfully, I did in fact enjoy it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, this is one of my favorite childhood films. Uh, I watched this one as a kid, and I've just returned to it over and over again with the same, if not more, love and an adoration for just what this film is. And especially as I've grown more accustomed to like my knowledge of film and what it means, I find so much more to take from it. This film came out on June 18th of 1993. It was directed by John McTiernan. For those that don't know, he is of Predator and Die Hard directing fame. Um, it was written by Shane Black and David Arnott. Shane Black, for a lot of people that don't know, um, wrote The Nice Guys as well as Iron Man 3. This movie is obviously starring the great Arnold Schwarzenegger as Jack Slater. We have Charles Dance as our assassin, Benedict. Anthony Quinn, two-time Academy Award winner, playing the head of the Mafia family, Vivaldi. Austin O'Brien, our main uh, lens protagonist, playing Danny Madigan. And of course, the small but charming role of uh, Nick, the projectionist, played by Robert Prosky. Before we get into the good though, there's a reason it's on the vice list. These are movies that people don't like, or were terrible flops. So we wanna address the bad, the things that made this movie bad, how people look back at it, either not fondly or with a lot of hate. So we're gonna kick it off with the stuff that made this an uphill battle. It's kind of weird to hear about an Arnold Schwarzenegger film that did bad or is not so loved. You know, this was at the heyday of action films, the heyday of Schwarzenegger. So when this film was being made, um, the first cut actually did not test so well with the audiences. They gave a quick little run, but they know they had to pump the movie out. So within four to five weeks, they just had to just rush it right out to the theater. And when they got it out, they didn't know that the following week was going to be the release of this a little independent gem. Um, it was directed by some guy who made kind of an artsy oh, black gosh. and white Holocaust film that won an Academy Award or the, whatever. The Oscars, they always go with like these artsy directors. Yeah. Why can't they just go with the big, flamboyant, science fiction action film no, things, you know? Not. Yeah, Jurassic Park, one of the most important <laughs> and influential films of all time, came out a week after. So now looking back at this, you, you go, what do you mean? Why would you ever release a film one week before one of the biggest uh, box office successes of all time? Well, it's simple. Uh, back then, they didn't really pay attention all too much with that, and they didn't think that Jurassic Park was going to be as big as it is now. Poor last action hero, only lasting one week before getting completely swept on the rug and basically forgotten. Yeah, this film is... Uh counted among the most uh, forgettable films for uh, uh, quite a few reasons. Obviously, Jurassic Park being it. Also, the audience reaction to the film. For those people that went out to theaters to go see the film, they were not necessarily enamored with this kind of a movie. It was a movie where the protagonist, played by, of all people, Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time, was making fun of himself. He was referencing his old movies and kind of like laughing at himself, making himself look like a fool. He was doing a lot more comedy. Hi. You know, you've got the character uh, of Danny Madigan kind of commenting on how impactful he is. No, it is impossible. What's not possible? He's fantastic. This is his best performance ever. Hey, but that was you. You were in that movie. But Arnold being so ignorant of it because he's this fictional character, people just could not line up or uh, find anything to hold on to that they were expecting when they saw movies. And obviously nowadays we talk about movies in the 21st century as a a way of art that we don't go into with preconceived notions. You know, we see the trailer, we get a sense of it, but we're not looking at the movie to be exactly what we need it to be. And if you are, here's a caution 
don't do that. <laughs> it's not a good idea. You're going to find yourself very disappointed with movies if you go in expecting something. But this was the go-to format for how people saw movies. Uh, with that, Arnold, obviously, in retrospect, has always cited this movie as the beginning of the end of his film career, unfortunately. After 10 years of back-to-back-to-back uh, -to -back -to -back hits, box office hits, his name being the grocer, the earner. This was the movie that was a failure. He never quite found his stride again on the big screen, um, never quite found a good footing in terms of box office success, and he cited that, as well as John McTiernan, you know, coming off of Predator and Die Hard and doing this movie. The embarrassment of just how poorly the movie was both put together, the frustration with studios, and with obviously the lackluster audience reaction caused uh, McTiernan to kind of seclude himself at home and just kind of take a break from movies. It's so sad, you know, and I'm so glad that we are able to, in this format, kind of bring this movie to light because as much as it's not a perfect film, far from it, there is so much charm and beauty within the film that we want to praise Arnold McTiernan, you guys did a good thing. This movie really hits a lot of really fun numbers, and especially in retrospect, coming back to it, like we hope we can help a lot of people do, you know, people are going to find this movie to be a crowd pleaser. So. Yeah, because I, I went in not knowing much. I was expecting just a cheesy kind of machismo action film. Mm -hmm. And when we got the opening with Danny going to the theater and, and a magical ticket, I was like, kind of looking at Ken. I was like, uh, is this going to be what I think it is going to be like Jingle All the Way? Is it going to be <laughs> some like cheesy, dumb family movie? And what I ended up getting was just a fantastic meta ride into uh, action films. We all like action movies in some way, shape or form. Hell, Marvel runs <laughs> movies right now, all thanks to action. And so this was a, a fun movie to break down that 80s and 90s era of action. Because nowadays, meta is the thing. We have Deadpool. We have Cabin in the Woods, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. All these films that people are loved for being meta. But last action era was a of its time yep. you know did it made 20 years before anybody else and, and you know back then it wasn't cool but now all of a sudden it is yep and uh, I, i'm thankful to be able to watch this and and have all those loves growing up watching those uh, schwarzenegger films and be able to get that meta fun joke yeah. about what the film is because the after they get through the cheesy ticket thing and we get into jack slater's world you're just in a non-stop riot of all these in jokes all this over-the-top action all the great one-liners and i ended up actually really enjoying it uh, much more than I thought. So uh, that, that's one point for KP here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and just like the mayor said, you know, this was kind of ahead of its time. And not to say that it was the first to break the mold, to break the fourth wall, to do the matter, but it, I think it was one of the first, like, kind of uh, box office drive films, you know, mm -hmm. art house films have been doing it for a century almost, mm -hmm. you know, uh, kind of uh, bringing the audience in. But this movie with the kind of genre that it is being an action film, a comedy film, something for the family, you know, Arnold was a big proponent. Hey, this was his first film as a producer. He was a big proponent for making this movie PG-13 so that it wasn't just for adults, mm -hmm. it was for kids. I don't want to say it. Say what? You can't. You can't possibly say it. Because this movie is PG-13. You know, this was a movie attempting to be a broad audience pleaser. And unfortunately, there was just too much going against it. This is a postmodern satire. You know, this is talking about the genre of action. The commentary on stardom for someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger. What fame influences on his audience member, obviously embodied with Danny Madigan. What kind of stuff doesn't happen here, Jack? Because this world stinks! Hey. The world is what you make of it, Danny. Now, if you want to give up and go home, then go ahead. You believed in me in the movies. Why not now? And obviously, a social commentary on violence in and of itself. You don't get that until ver the very end in the third act. Obviously, when you're in the movie, it's, you know, it's the risks are being taken, the violence is happening, but Danny is completely aware of the fact that it's just like, it's fine, it's a movie, you know? Even if I were to be in danger, I'm sidekicked with the main hero. I'll be fine. That's not this type of film. But then once we kind of reintegrate ourselves through the fourth wall again and find ourselves in the real world, the gravity and the weight of violence and what it is on both society as a norm, as well as what it does to the characters, what it does to Jack Slater, what it inspires in Benedict to do is really telling for kind of a reverse 
of how violence influences. Violence becomes so commonplace, but in a different way for a fictional character, and that's really insightful. Yeah. When we're in the Jack Slater universe, it's just a fun, over-the-top action. We have exploding cars, uh, over-the-top, you know, shootouts and stuff, and it's a blast. For lovers of stunt work, Last Action Hero is just masterful, because it looks like also they're having the time of their life while doing it, because it's such a fun movie. But when we're with our, our cheesy villain, Benedict, the over-the-top glass eye that is Charles Dance, having the time of his life, hamming it up, once he crosses into the real world, the, the action is not over the top because that's just not what real life is. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he sees a man get murdered for a pair of shoes on the street and no one even bats an eye at it. And later on, the film, he ends up killing a man and just goes, I've just shot somebody. I did it on purpose. And you hear a man from the, just from down the alley, you know, just tell him to mm -hmm. shut up. Like, yeah. we're trying to sleep. Yeah, who cares? Know? Hey, shut up down there. That plays really well in that chase scene where, you know, Jack has to shoot the car, you know, he does the head-on collision, you know, which he always survives, and they make the reference to the idea that, like, you know, Danny's like, you can't do it, you'll die. That's a head-on collision, you're gonna crash. He's like, I'm gonna put chicken with this guy, and he does it, and you watch the cars violently crash into each other, and Danny is so terrified for Jack, and thankfully Jack gets out, but then there's a reference to why he survives. It's not because it's an action film, it's because, hey, 89 Mercury Sable, Standard driver size airbag, check a cap, no airbag. Who is stuck? So that reference to reality is a constant meta moment to just kind of like reiterate to the audience. It's like your expectations and reality are vastly different things. Yeah. And we're having fun with it, but we're also commenting on it. Yeah. It's great. That's why I was getting a kick out of it because I was expecting just a cheesy time, but we actually got really smart messages hidden mm -hmm. within this. You know, Shane Black's a great writer, one of the best writers of that kind of sharp comedy. So when I was watching it, you know, especially the scene with uh, Benedict killing guy, I, I was like laughing, but at the same time, you know, with like that half cock smile, it's like, ah, ha, ha, because I'm like, ooh, that's hitting a bit too, a bit too honest. Yep. you know but in a, in a great way yes so be, besides the writing being so masterful in terms of a, a, a fun meta commentary we also have just so many jokes and surprises that came with this film i thought i thought it was gonna be jack slade i thought i was just gonna have arnold and maybe like one or two surprise people Oh no, you did not warn me about all these. What are what are some of your favorite uh, cameos oh. and surprises oh, for goodness. this film? I mean, it kicks off right away as we enter the police department. You've got Sharon Stone embodying basic instinct, <laughs> the white dress, the smoking the cigarette. And just as we're moving through the police station, we pan to the right, Robert Patrick walks by as T-1000. We just watched T-2, one of the biggest movies, you know, of the decade, if not unquestionably the year before. And you got Arnold getting Robert Patrick, hey, come by. Get in the uniform. I want you to just walk by and do this for me. And it just, it just plays so well with the idea of just like the movies we love growing and growing. And I know for us, especially for the mayor, you know, we just watched Amadeus yeah. this year for his first time. And the appearance of F. Murray Abraham was quite a treasure for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It took me back. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, we just watched Amadeus. And I hope we can make a video about that someday because it's instantly become one of my favorite films. But the fact we watched that. At first, it, right into this was like the perfect setup. I don't even know if you meant to do it. Oh, I did. <laughs> was this a setup? <laughs> because uh, F. Murray Abraham, uh, it, it plays, uh, what's the detective's name? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. Uh, he plays John Practice from the FBI. Yeah, John Practice. And, and and Danny sees him and he instantly tells Jack, like, you can't trust him. That, that's Salieri. He killed Mozart. And then Jack Slater's response, who? Oh, the day is you won eight Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and the great joke about John Practice, you know, the, the name Practice being used as if, you know, the musical practicing of Salieri and Mozart, too. It's like a double entendre joke on yeah, top of it. It's so good. What's that? Mozart? The guy Practice killed? That's right, Jack. It's so clever. Um, but that, that really got me because, like I said, we just watched Amadeus. But the one that just ascended it for me was a point there's a cartoon cat detective pops out and it's voice by Danny DeVito. Hell yes. Uncredited too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, I'm like this, that's how we, I knew they're gonna take this film to 100. There was no holding back now. He hops in and he completely stands out and it, I died laughing instantly. He appears, I think only like two or three times for the film, but every time he does, you know, I felt like Leonardo DiCaprio and Once Upon a Time, I'm like, oh my. 
You know, ah, you know, that, that's me throughout this whole film, though. This, all the end jokes and all the surprises are great. And there's one in particular for cinephiles, a surprise appearance by a very beloved British actor. Yes, that's right. So uh, early on in the film, before uh, Danny jumps into the movie, he has to get to class and he's late to class and his teacher is introducing um, Shakespeare. They're talking about Shakespeare in the class and the teacher decides to introduce Hamlet. You know, they're talking about Shakespeare. What a great one. And they pick Laurence Olivier's Academy Award winning Best Picture and his Best Actor performance uh, of Hamlet. And what a lot of people don't know, unless you're a nice big fan of it, the actress who plays the teacher that introduces the film is Joan Plowright. Uh, Joan Plowright is a, uh, a wonderful uh, little British actress who's known for m mostly television and a few films. But what a lot of people don't know is that that was Laurence Olivier's wife when he passed away. She is his widow. So the met, even the meta nature there of getting the actress to play a teacher, introducing her late husband's work and referencing it in terms of the accolades, you know, while obviously being very fully aware of her actual intimate relationship with the person she's introducing as the actor that he is, is a wonderful piece of homage to just both, not just uh, the the meta commentary of, of real life and film, but also the history of film, how film impacts us all how it it absorbs us, it takes us, it transports us, whether it's the action films that Danny loves or the artistic uh, adaptation of lyrical and uh, poetic masterworks of some of the greatest uh, playwrights of uh, of all time, you know, over the last, you know, hundreds of years. Man. It's incredibly uh, thoughtful and heartfelt while being a little bit funny at the same time. You laugh, you know, and what it does with it is just quite hilarious. <laughs> yeah, there's there's levels that they just pile on for this film. It's not just for people that love action films. Like I said, there's just a great meta humor for anyone to enjoy. Uh, even the beloved Sir Ian McKellen makes an appearance, and I don't want to spoil uh, who he ends up playing, but his cameo is just absolutely perfect and something that me and you just, we enjoy and we die over for how clever it is. Yeah, and especially as I, when I watched it as a kid, it's just an actor. Yeah. You know, and of course, re-watching mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Lord of the Rings when it came about in the early 2000s and then I returned to the last action hero and I found that gem. You know, I love that movie. And all of a sudden it just dawns on me as soon as Ian McKellen turns off screen and he kind of just like makes his motion I'm like yeah. holy moly yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's McKellen and that was just a great moment for me to be like my love of cinema transcends any specific time period. I don't just have to embrace film in the moment and critique. We don't have to be so self-aware right now. That's yeah. why we love movies. We can look back at movies 10, 20, 50, almost 100 years ago now and appreciate the impact that cinema has on us. And that's what's really beautiful. This movie is very much a love letter. It's very much, it embodies what we love about films. The idea that if we could transport ourselves into our favorite movies, good, bad, dark, horror, comedy, romance, whatever it could be, we could find something that just takes our breath away. And to be there alive in it is something we envy, we embody in Danny, and it makes us jealous, envious of that. And that journey is something that is so magical. Yeah, it touches the, the kid inside you because we've all fantasized at some point in our life what it would be like to be in the movie, be in that situation. And Last Action Hero just takes that and you get one of the most enjoyable rides. Uh, I, I went in with no expectations and I walked out, like I said, very, very pleased by it. And which is how much the, the love of meta and action films are still going so strong to this day. I think it's very important for people to really give a rewatch, you know, for what this did to Arnold's career. I think we owe it to him, you know, to give this film a rewatch and, and, and to, to, to dig it back up. And, uh, you know, show this off for everybody because no matter what, I think you're going to enjoy it. it. It's a good time. As someone who very much loves this film, I, I want to make sure that when people hear about it, see it, they don't dismiss it. You know, as much as you may not know about it, it may feel like the average one. You know, you look at the reviews online and you're just like, eh, mediocre. It's what everyone else is like, give it a chance, guys. You'll find yourselves really falling in love with something that's just so fun and very much wants you to fall in love with it and not in a manipulative way. It's not manipulation. It's just. We love movies too. That's the, where you see that with how Arnold and McTiernan, you know, pursued making this movie. And it's just a shame that it didn't get the audience it had. And hopefully, you know, 28 years later, you know, we can look back at it and go, what a gem. Yeah. You know, what a little treasure. Yeah. So. If we can even get one viewer on this video to you watch The Last Action Hero, you've done your duty. Absolutely. So. Happy to be here. So that, that's going to be the end of our video, guys. Uh, if you're one of the dozens of uh, Last Action Hero fans left, just like KP, please let us know down below in the comments. Make sure to like the video. Hit that bell for notifications. We're going to be bringing you videos on everything from Oscars to Criterions to over-the-top action films. Make sure to please come back. And also, maybe you don't want to see us on YouTube. Maybe a little bit of love on Instagram and social media. We'll put the links down below. We're going to put some fun stuff, I'm sure. We'll see. Start in OnlyFans? I don't know. Let us know down in the comments. Maybe we can work something out. But until then, 
We'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye.